I just love those songs that we sang today. And I want to encourage you today to speak the name of Jesus over every situation and circumstance that you have. You're wondering probably why I have a towel. Well, there's my towel. So just have it there for a second. Now, according to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a towel is about the most massively useful thing an interstellar hitchhiker can have. Some of you will get that. Some of you will not. Look up Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and you'll see. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and the honor of being able to come to you today. God, we ask that you would speak to our hearts and to our lives. Move upon our hearts. Move upon us today, Lord. Give us eyes to see and ears that would hear what the message would say to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I'm going to leave my towel there just for a moment because it has a significant spiritual meaning that I'm going to talk about a little bit later on in the message. I'm closing off our messages on the Beatitudes. Uh, this one I entitled, Don't Forget Your Towel. Don't forget your towel. And it's funny because my wife and I were talking about this and just going to throw this out there. Uh, I get to the office this morning and guess what I did? I forgot my towel. So I texted my wife and said, can you bring my towel? I forgot to bring it. So she laughs back, really? <laughs> I guess it's just an 82-year-old eccentric New Mexico millionaire kind of thing. Forrest Fenn, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, filled a treasure chest with up to $3 million in coins, diamonds, emeralds, and then buried it somewhere. Then he challenged America and said, go out and find it. It all started when he was diagnosed with cancer in 1988. And Fenn was going to bury the treasure and die out in the wilderness, leaving the treasure hidden as a treasure of his legacy. He survived the cancer but move forward with the treasure plans. Fenn provided an unusual map to help people find the treasure, a poem with nine clues hidden in it. But the very, he, he had a very defined, uh, definite philosophy in his, in his autobiography, which was called The Thrill of the Chase. He laid it out for us, and he said this. He wrote about the rare and valuable things that he had collected over the years and, and how the real treasure in life is the pursuit itself. It really is about the journey and not necessarily all the time about the destination that you get to. By bearing his treasure, he was trying to show as many people as possible what he meant. He was saying, turn off the TV. Get away from those video games. Put your phone down. Do something real in life for a change. Instead of just living vicariously on the adventures of, of fictional people in our living room screens, go after the true prize of life itself. We have turned into a society. I have gone and, and do this, and I have been guilty of it as well. Go to a restaurant, a, 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 a coffee shop, anywhere. For crying out loud, just standing on the street and watch people walking down the street with their phones. And there's, there, there's little videos, or reels, I think they call them, on Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff there. Where, where people sit there, uh, yeah, Instagram, where they are on their phone, they don't see, they walk into a tree. Watch people as couples are out together sitting at the table, texting each other as they're sitting across each other at the table. Turn off the television. Put down the remote for the computer game. Put the phone down and go after the real prize, which is life itself. That's what we say. Fans and messages is, is, uh, is that anything truly worth having must be pursued. 
You can own the TV uh, DVD of Treasure Island, or you can get out of your recliner and live the story, letting people to live vicariously through your adventures. The best life stuff in life is buried. Did you know that? It's not out in the open. You have to go after it. You have to figure out where to dig, and, and then you have to lay claim on it. Fenn believes it's high time people give up their mass marketing dreams and do something real and memorable for their, and with their lives. You, you, got, you got to admit that he has a very compelling point. And all of us have been caught up in this whole social media, television, uh, phone uh, drama of a lifetime. He has challenged, he has inspired thousands of people to go in the quest and to, to find the hidden treasure which so far has ended, has eluded all pursuers. No one has found it yet. Every now and again, uh, he, he would publish new clues based on, on uh, undesired developments. And it, it's not in the graveyard, graveyard, so please don't go and dig that up. It's not in historical landmarks, so don't dig there either. But I suspect because of the way most of us are wired that he's touched a nerve. Who wouldn't want to find several million dollars in a treasure? People believe there's something out there for them, but they can't seem to find it. Have you ever thought to yourself in your mind, there's got to be something more than what I'm experiencing now, and there is. Life itself is kind of a treasure hunt. And you have to think hard about what you're looking for and where to dig. Write this down. And where do you find the map? In the movie, somehow, we, someone always finds an old treasure map. I love those old movies where they got this map and it's, it's part of its torn away and supposedly left by some pirate who was opposed, opposed to conventional banking. And the question is always whether the map is authentic. Someone says, this is it. This is the real map and the treasure is on the island and called Achievement. So you started out on your explore expedition, and it's hard walking and digging and digging. And after about 50 to 60 hours of work weeks, we find it that it, recognition, promotion, salary, and it doesn't seem really like that much of a treasure after all. So why do we work so hard for that? Something else, someone else is squinting at the map on the island of wealth and they're looking at it and the thrill of pursuit is nice. But you, you'd like to find a treasure that's ultimately worth something, we think. And eventually you find yourself singing the song, I haven't found what I'm looking for. Write this down. Death is life. I know that sounds weird, but death is life. The Bible says that life's real prize is hidden. And you have to know where to search for it. I love what Paul the Apostle says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Death is life. Paul says to, that to live it, you must die first. In the gospel, it's filled with paradoxes of, uh, of statements, and this is the ultimate one. The, the, the end of who I am is, is where real life begins. When I die to myself, die to my dreams, my hopes, my aspirations, and all that. That's where real life begins. And Jesus says that once I die, I can truly live. Death is life. Jesus closed the greatest sermon of all time, talking about two different paths, one leading to life and the other to destruction. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, we read these words. You can, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. Say narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. 
And, the, and this gate is wide for many who choose that way. I don't know why, but they do. But the gateway to life is narrow, and the road is difficult. And few ever find it. You can call it the first clue to the map of Jesus that he leaves for us. Write this down. Look for the narrow gate. Don't look for the broad one because we know which way that leads to. It won't be beautifully decorated or impressive. The gate is kind, the kind that most people ignore. I don't want to go, that doesn't look promising. I don't want that gate. Hey, remember that, that, that old uh, television series show, I think it was Bob Barker? Come on down. The price was right. Remember that show? I'm old enough to remember it. Oh, my goodness. I watched a couple episodes. I wasn't really big into TV when I was younger. And, that, and I watched a couple episodes, and he had to guess what was behind each door. Life can be like that. So we don't really know what's on the other side. And the gateway leading to eternal life doesn't always look that impressive. It doesn't. And many people miss it, but if we walk through it, and you get eternal life. And some people think, well, if I walk through that gate, won't the good times start coming? Won't everything just be perfect and right? And no, no more problems after I walk through that gate, right? Wrong. You may know I hear this, but when you walk through the gate that leads to life, it's, Jesus said it's a difficult it's not an easy pathway. You can expect a tough path, one seldom walked by others. It, it, it crosses through death but leads to life. Of all the upside-down teachings of Jesus, this one is the greatest challenge to our, our sense of the world. Understand one thing. When Christ calls someone, he bids them to come and die. Come and die, and then you will live. Death is nobody's favorite word. We tiptoe around it with nicer names like someone passed on. They've gone ahead. They've crossed the river. They're singing in the eternal choir because you know God needed another angel. Let me pause there for one second. Let me throw this in here. That please understand that no one who has ever died will ever become an angel. You don't die and get your wings and become an angel. Our loved ones are not angels in heaven singing in an eternal choir. That is just not scriptural. There are angels in heaven, but we don't become angels. If polite and reverent words aren't our thing, then we try to whistle past the graveyard with a more in entertaining terms, like they kicked the bucket. They bought the farm. They're pushing up daisies, even croaked. Bit the big one, cashed in his chips. We either over softened the term or we tried to make a joke because death frightens us. Anything other than take it for what it is, but, but mere speech Beyond mere speech, we, we do everything we can to live in denial of the reality of death. We need to realize one thing, that none of us are getting off this rock we call earth alive. Did you know that? If Jesus does not come back in the rapture and bring us home within the next 50 to 60 years, every single person in this room is going to die. Isn't that encouraging news? None of us are getting out of here alive. So we need to grab a hold of the reality of death, and all of us will die. We show the world our des desperation to avoid it as if nothing good become waiting on the other side, or at least if we're not that sure. And many Christians are not sure even with that. It's not a very persuasive testimony for Christians to show the world that we're dragging and kicking and screaming to be the one we've been worshiping all this time. 
And even so, Jesus urges us to die. Not physical death, of course. Why not live to be a ripe old age? Move to Florida, drive a Buick. No, Jesus is speaking of dying to ourselves. And that sometimes is the hardest death of all. Our culture, of course, is all about celebrating ourselves. We want to pull ourselves up, finding more life in ourselves. Even preachers have gotten to the idea and have preached self-help sermons for years. Catering to the self-important believers that still think this Christian gig is about them. I, <laughs> I have subscriptions to multiple um, book club, CBD is one. I can get a lot of books on Amazon, Kindle, Kobo, all those books. And I see all these, I won't name names because I don't want to offend anyone. But you see some of these big name preachers got these, you know, be a better you. Self-help books for Christians. And Jesus is, is saying, you know, this whole Christianity, this whole faith in me is not about you. It's about me, he says. But no matter how, how hard we look, none of the maps lead there. We spend years heading down the road of living for self instead of dying to it. And it's difficult to admit we've made the wrong choice many, many, many times. We've gone so, far, so many miles and, and, and we, we've invested too much into the journey. So we double down and we step on the gas. We're like we're going for what is it, a, a penny for a pound? Is that the saying? And when we've chosen the wrong road, we don't want to acknowledge it to ourselves or anyone else. You know the, the, the concept that men do not like to ask for directions. I remember that I used to, in my private bathroom time, when we moved to London, remember the maps? I'd memorize maps because I don't like being lost. I cannot stand being lost. Now we got GPS on our phones and I was taking someone to the, uh, the hospital just last week and put it on there. I just hit it on there, uh, navigate to Metropolitan Hospital, Windsor, Ontario, or the OLED one, the, the, that come to do best, right? And just follow. It's like easy. But I'm not the typical man. If I'm lost, I will be the first to pull over and say, hey, where, 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 where is this place? Where is that place? But generally, men don't like asking for directions. I don't know why. And we as Christians, when we make a mistake, when we're going down the wrong pathway and life is just unfolding before us, we don't want to stop and say, you know what, I think I've took a wrong turn. How do I get back on the pathway again? Because spiritual pride comes up and says, well, I'm supposed to be a leader in the church. I'm just supposed to be, I've been in this Christianity thing now for 10, 20, 30 years. Shouldn't I have, but, but we all make mistakes. There's not a single person in this room that's not gone down the wrong pathway of life at least once or twice. We don't like to acknowledge it to ourselves or anyone else. And yet every now and again, we we hear wealthy athletes, successful business people, and cele uh, celebrate performance speak of the struggle with depression and, and dealing with feelings of depression and, wor and worthlessness. And we hear about ce celebrities taking their own life. And just for a moment, we wonder, have we been lied to? Yes, you have. That was the fast lane, the one that everyone wants to drive. Let you know another little secret of my driving thing. I hate being behind people. I don't know why that is. They could be doing the speed limit, but I've got to get past them. Now I do it safely. I've got to get past them. Just I hate being behind people. I like driving in the fast lane. I do. Another pet peeve, I just got to throw this as a day for pet peeves. When people are driving below the speed limit in the, in the passing lane. And they pass the sign that says, keep to the right, except to pass. I'm like, do you not know how to read? 
Everyone wants to drive in the fast lane. He had money. She had fame. How could they not have been living the life? There are two different paths. One path is narrow, difficult, and marked with death but leads to life. The, the other path is broad, crowded, and, and marked life but leads to death. I think it's Proverbs 14 that says there is a way that seems right unto men, but the end thereof is death. The wide pathway that the world is traveling on has on it, this is the way, this is life, this is what you want. But they don't realize when they get to the end of their road, when they pass all the cutoffs and all the turnabouts, then they find out this road is leading me to death. And sometimes it's too late then. In Matthew 16, Jesus tells us what we can expect when we follow him down the narrow road. In Matthew 16, 24 and 25, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any one of you wants to be my followers, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. I don't know if I like that plan. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. How do dead people think? How do we die to ourselves? I've been around my share of dead people. I've been in a room before the coroner comes in. I've helped the funeral director on several occasions move and transport a dead body. People from this church. I sat with families as their father and husband took their last breath. I stood next to many open caskets and friends and families walk up to say goodbye. And I don't mean to be coarse, but one thing I've noticed about dead people, they don't really seem to care very much about what people think of them. They're not concerned with how nice their clothes look. <laughs> they couldn't care less. Dead people aren't caught up in stock investments, nor do they show much interest in getting a promotion. Death renders all worldly points invalid. It's the, it's the ultimate required surrender of yourself and all that you have. When Jesus speaks of dying to himself, this is what he wants us to think about. All the stuff in this world is dead to us, and we're dead to it. Do you know why I've seen, and please don't, it, well, if you're offended, who cares to get over it? I see more and more Christians throughout the, the coming months, years, trying to see how close they can have their one foot in the world and the other foot in Christianity and seeing how close they can be on both camps. There are many Christians I see and I watch their lives. And I'll be honest, it's hard to tell who's a believer nowadays and who's not. Because they all do say and act the same way. I'm thinking, you know, the Bible says that the, wor the world is supposed to be able to look at us and say, hey, there's something different about you. I remember this guy, his name was Rick Crotus, I think his last name was. He, worked, he drive, drove a dump truck, and he was the size of a dump truck. He had muscles upon his muscles. And he, he looked like Sylvester Stallone, at least a little shorter. And he had to walk literally like this, his arms, because I don't even know what those muscles are called. He had them. They can't close like, he couldn't close his arms like, I can close my, I can fall like this. He's like this all the time because his arms are so big and his back and his chest, everything. The man needed or a bra. Just say. And here he comes, and this guy, he looked me, he looked like Sylvester Stallone. If he had bandana and, and, and one of those things on his head and machine gun, he's like, you are one of those movies. We're sitting at Tim Hortons in Hamilton, Ontario. This is years ago in the 80s, and I was a brand new believer, and we hang out there sometimes. He walks over to our table like, and he's got this mean look in his face. I'm like, oh, dear Jesus, I'm coming to see you soon. He walks right up to him, sits down right across from him and says, 
you believe in something, don't you? I'm like, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, 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 what do you want me to believe in? <laughs> like when the guy said at the table, the person next to him had moved because his, his, his sobriety, they had moved over. He says, I don't know what it is, but there's something different that I see you every time you come in here. Something different. What is it? You got some type of religion thing going on? I want it. I'm thinking, where are the people asking us, saying and looking and telling us there's something different about you? What is it? Because I'll be totally honest, and if you're watching online or if you're on Facebook more than you're in your Bible, then forgive me. But I'm finding a hard time deciphering between the believers of this world and the unbelievers of this world. Because we all do and act and say the same things. And God has called us to die to ourselves. Jesus has called us to live differently. That when the world sees us, one of, the, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, it says that they took note that these men had been with Jesus. How? What, did they have a, a, what would Jesus do, T-shirt on? Did they have a little fish bumbo sticker on the back of their chariot or their donkey? They didn't walk around with, with, with a... 100-pound Schofield Bible or the big Thompson chain King James Bible? No. By how they conducted, how they act, how they lived their lives. See, this whole message stumped the disciples as well. On three occasions, they got caught up with disputes about which one of them was the greatest. They were following the teacher who, caught, who taught them that the last would be the first and who showed them a model of servanthood every day. But it was difficult for them to break loose of the lifetime of, of thought training. They, they tried to reconcile the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God, and they, it can't be done. And maybe that's been a challenge for you uh, as you're sitting here and walking through your Christian life as well. The journey to the end of ourselves, to dying to ourselves, requires a completely different way of looking at this world. It's not natural, and it doesn't come easily. For the disciples, it, it, it ultimately came down to the question of life versus death. They had to decide whether they were going to live for themselves or die to themselves. It's the same choice that Jesus asks us today. We want to be served I won't get into my rant I had a couple of weeks ago about volunteers. But we want to come and we want to be served. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. I think he even said that. We want our every need met with loving, tender care. But Jesus says, that's not on the itinerary. Here again is the treasure quest he offers from the passage of Matthew 16. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Follow him. And prepare to die. It's not the most exciting travel plan. What you planning for the summer? Oh, I'm going to die. Oh. Hope you have fun. But it's the reason the treasure is so elusive and, 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 and few seek it. You, you must enter the narrow of the narrowest of gates, travel the roughest road, carry the cross on which you are prepared to die. And if you do all that sincerely and, and, and follow the steps of Jesus, the crazy thing will happen. You will actually find the one true life. As I said earlier, the end of me is where life really begins. So don't forget your towel. Jesus didn't forget his towel because he used it. All through the Gospels, Jesus offers his life as a picture of teaching. In John chapter 13 is the most striking example of what it means to die to self. What it looks like. It violates every tenet of the world system. It involves service over rule. 
Humility over pride. All the contradictions Jesus had been living and teaching us. It contradicts everything. Many people like to sit there and tell other people what to do. That's not what God wants. Many people I've seen in churches where, where it's pastors, board members, teachers, ministry leaders, like the position of that, but they like it because of the power that it holds. Understand one thing. If you are in a ministry leadership position, whether you are a pastor, a board member, ministry leader, a committee, whatever you're leading in that, you are not a dictator. You are not in control of Jesus. Is. You are in a servant position. You lead by serving. The Son of God did that. Involve service. In this narrative, we step through the quiet upper room of a house where Jesus sits and with his 12 disciples. It's past sundown on Thursday evening, and some of the men are still miffed over the other argument, over the pecking order of who's who. I've been in this ministry thing long enough. I've seen churches destroyed because people got upset and said, well, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. None of you are in charge, but God is. Three years down the path, and they're still failing to understand the most central idea that Jesus has been showing him. So Jesus declines to preach another sermon. If I were there, I'd say, Jesus, here's my King James Bible. Because, you know, that's what Paul used. Here's my King James Bible. Go after, preach a, a really fiery sermon at these guys. Show them who's boss. You're the man in charge. Like you're, Jesus, you're the Messiah. But he refuses and declines to ser- preach another sermon. And what he does instead is shocking and even distasteful to some of them. He picks up a towel and begins to wash feet. The most powerful teaching of all. Of course, is Jesus living the life of utter humility rather than the way of a proud and influential rabbi? The fact that the leader is serving his followers is odd enough, and people don't do that nowadays. But it's actually a bit stranger than that. John tells us that Judas had already been tempted by the devil to betray Jesus. So sell him, to sell him out to the men who wanted him dead. John also tells us in John 13, verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. In other words, Jesus fully understood his divine identity. He knew who he was. He knew he was God. He knew he had all the power of heaven and earth was at his command. And, the, and he, this understanding, he allowed himself to be betrayed, to be taken, to be beaten, to be mocked, given a, a, a farce of a trial, and then crucified. As he knew his status was the highest, he took up the lowest road. The most humble posture, he proceeded to wash the feet of a man who had ranged for his death. Oh. <laughs> Let that just sink in for just a moment. If I betrayed you, and I do something to hurt you, I mean really hurt you, and I do it purposely, knowing what I'm doing. I stab you in the back, and you're hurt. How are you going to respond to it and say, hey, how you doing? What's up? What's up? Want to go for coffee? Can you buy? You'd be like, are you kidding me? you you would make up, you probably try to be polite, but you make up some excuse saying, oh, I, I'm busy, uh, I got to get the car fixed. Hang up and you say to your wife or your husband or whatever, you say, can you believe the nerve of that guy after what he did? He wants 
to go for a coffee. He wants me to help him with his garden or this or that, whatever. Man, some people just have, have, have all the nerve, don't they? Yet Jesus is washing the feet of the man who is about to betray him. That's a hard thing. As we step into the room, we know that he's surrounded by men he loves and he modeled after him. And who will now abandon him at the first sign of danger. Jesus will sell his whereabouts for a few coins. Peter will deny the, any knowledge of the man that he has proclaimed as the son of God. After three years of teaching multitude, performing miracles, healing diseases, raising people from the dead, and bonding with his disciples, Jesus will proceed to his uh, inglorious execution with only John and a few women still following him. There's something wrong with this picture, guys. The rapturous crowds have vanished. They're gone. The hour of the mockers and the bloodthirsty people have arrived. And Jesus knew all this. You and I, with the same knowledge and the same power, would probably either run away or do something even worse. We might have some leverage of that power against the forces set against us. At least we might have given the disciples an earful. But Jesus took a towel. I don't know if it was like this towel, not, maybe not as fancy. Dipped it in water and continued to wash the feet of the disciples. The disciples were shocked, but not as much as they would have been if the full story, if they knew it as we did. They didn't know what about Judas. They didn't foresee the cross, yet still the scene was very highly unsettling. John 15, 13, 4 and 5 says he got up from a meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, deny, drying them with a towel that he had wrapped around him. Roads were dusty, and eating was done on the floor. This made foot washing an essential task, but it was a job reserved for the lowest of servants. A slave would take care of this. It would have been beneath the disciples, so none of them volunteered. Like, they were too, like, we're, we're, we're too good for that. Certainly not in the wake of an argument over who was the greatest and the most important among them. I'm not doing that, like, I don't want to sit at the right hand of God beside Jesus because I'm important, like I'm all that. There seemed to be no servants around them. Maybe they would have simply eaten with dirty, f ugly feet in view. And who knows? And probably to, the, to a respectable person with this washing, it would be horrible. But Jesus knelt and scrubs away the grime anyway. I'm going to close with these thoughts. This life of self-importance that appeals so much to us. Because it's just us and those who serve us. A towel and water of life is a mirror image of that. It doesn't appeal to us. Why should I do this, we ask? Why should I volunteer? Why should I serve? Someone should serve me just once. Don't I do more than my part? Why can't I have it easy as some people I could name? And as we sulk in our entertainment, we look down to see Jesus scrubbing our feet. Jesus, who's perfect and received as his reward the worst abuse men could offer. Jesus, God in the flesh, who humbled himself and took the form of a servant. Jesus, who give, gives to us so much his very life, knowing that we would offer him nothing in return. Jesus, who hung on the cross and interceded before God for the men who crucified him. 
And as he bled and slowly suffocated to death, he asked God to forgive his executioners for what they didn't really understand their actions. Come on. That's just crazy. Don't forget your towel. Jesus was at the end of his ministry, the end of his earthly life, the end of himself, but he knew that it was the beginning of something that, that, that changed everything. At the end of death and suffering and sacrifice comes the beginning of the resurrection. In order to serve those it's hardest to serve, you must die to yourself. And you find the most surprising and transforming blessing as you forgive those who have hurt you. To betray your bitterness and anger by, by flying in its face, by acting counter to it, is to escape the miserable grip it has on your life. It's to release yourself from the self-imposed prison sentence. But in that room, that day, Jesus washed the feet at the very moment when he might have been caught up in his own problems. When life isn't going well, you want to pull back and put on the bathrobe and go away. Eat some comfort food and maybe have some time for yourself. Flick on the TV and see what's new. When we're troubled, we do the exactly the wrong thing. Self-absorbent is a, absorption is a poor medicine. Tough times don't feel natural for serving others, do they? But it's amazing how healing it is to go and serve someone else when you're hurting yourself. Sure, you have friends who will probably come over and pamper you and serve you while you're, you brood. And, but Jesus did the exact, precisely the exact opposite. And not asking to be pampered. He pampered others. Perhaps his, he, he strengthened himself for the nightmare to come by taking the towel rather than the bathrobe. The healthiest thing you can do is in rugged waters is to serve someone else. The end of ourselves is about the towel. Service, encouragement, blessing others. I want to challenge you this morning to look around at home, at work, where you live, this church. And to find ways you can set aside the bathrobe and pick up the towel and go around and walk around as you're holding it like this, dying to yourself and reaching the end of yourself and going up to someone and say, how can I serve you? How can I help you? What do you need? You probably will be surprised with some answers that you will get. But do you have a towel? Don't forget it. Because Jesus picked up his towel before he picked up his cross. And he served. Father, thank you. Father, I, I, who knows what would happen who knows what will happen if Jesus says, you know what, I just, these people aren't worth it. They don't care anyway. The, most of them may not even remember me. So why am I even bothering? He would have a right to say that. But he didn't. He would have a right to say, I'm going to wash everyone's feet except for Peter and Judas because you guys are going to just run away. You're going to betray me, and you're going to deny me three times. So you know what? Forget it. You can have your dirty feet. But no, he washed the feet of those who were going to sell him out and betray him. Father, help us this morning to have a servant's attitude, a servant's heart. In everything we do, you've called us to serve. So God, as we leave this place in a few moments and, and go to our separate homes, may we start there. 
by serving our spouse, by serving our children, without expecting anything in return. May our life pursuits be that not of what the world places value in, but the treasure that you place value in. And Father, that means we will have to die to self because death is life. Be with us, Father, as we leave this place. And we thank you and we praise you for in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen and amen.